Hello and welcome to our latest Find My Past Live Web webinar. Um, I hope you're all having a lovely evening and you've been uh, enjoying your time off for the um, Anzac Day commemorations. We are now speaking to you live on a very sunny morning in London, which is quite rare for this time of year. Uh, my name is Alex Cox and you might know me from Find My Past Friday. Days. Um, I'm the man responsible for letting you know about all the lovely new records we release on a weekly basis. Uh, this week, I'm joined by a regular speaker of ours, our in-house military expert, Mr. Paul Nixon. Uh, Paul is an absolute pro when it comes to all things military, and especially World War One. The line that generally gets floated around the office is, um, what Paul doesn't know isn't worth knowing. <laughs> so um, over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, Paul's going to be guiding you through the surviving Anzac records that are still available, telling you how you can build your ancestors' stories and commemorate the sacrifices they made. Uh, he's also going to be looking at a rather interesting and I believe slightly tragic case study of three brothers who emigrated from Sussex and fought with the Anzac forces. Uh, so sit back and enjoy. As always, we'll be taking your questions throughout. We've got a team of experts um, dotted around the company who are answering as many as they can live and depending on how we do for time as well, um, I'm also going to pick out any particularly interesting or juicy questions I see and I'll be putting them to Paul live at the end. So yeah, that is enough from me. I'll now hand you over to Paul and we hope you enjoy. Oh, one thing I did want to add as well, sorry, I should always say this, is that um, if you miss any of this for any reason, someone knocks the door, the phone rings or... Um, you, can, you can watch this on demand, so a link will be sent to you um, within a couple of days. Um, oh, hang on a second, we're just, uh, would you, uh, sorry, we're just having some slide issues. There we go. Sorry about that, we had a minor moment, moment of panic then. Uh, Paul's slides seem to vanish, but they are now back. Um, so yeah, basically what I was saying was this will be available on demand. Uh, there'll be a link sent out to you and it'll be up on our YouTube channel so you can listen to it at your leisure. Uh, great, so now we have the slides. Uh, the panic is averted. We, um, we are going to begin. So I'll hand you over to Paul now. Um, and yeah, away we go. Uh, hello, good evening uh, if you're in Australia, good, uh, good morning if you're in the UK. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, finding your Anzac ancestors, um, so let's, uh, let's just shoot straight on. I can't actually see uh, my slides properly, I'm just seeing the little uh, images at the top of the screen, but anyway, let's see how we go. So, um, for those of you who um, uh, can't hear me, this message is now for you. Um, because uh, we are broadcasting live, so you should be seeing in front of you now uh, a screen that says uh, we're broadcasting, and if you can't uh, see this, don't worry, because uh, this will be posted on YouTube, and, um, and so you'll be able to go back and listen to it in due course. Um, so today, yes, of course, 25th of April um, 2017, it's Anzac Day, um, and in, in this country, it's, it's little known, I think, these days, but there still is a commemoration at... Um, um, Whitehall every uh, every Anzac Day. So uh, there was a dawn vigil this morning um, at the Australian War Memorial in Hyde Park. Um, that will be followed at 11 o'clock today by a, a wreath laying at the Cenotaph in London and follow, following that uh, at 12 o'clock there's a service of commemoration in Westminster Abbey. So although it attracts little attention I think these days on the media here, it still, it still is very active. Um, uh, the first, I've got, uh, actually got a photo on my wall at home, which uh, shows the uh, the commemoration in uh, in the 1930s, uh, and it's as busy then as it is today for the 11th of November here. So, uh, and rightly so, really. Um, we we owe a huge debt to the Australians and the New Zealanders, and of course, 25th of um, April 1915 was the anniversary of the landings at Gallipoli, in which uh, both those countries' uh, soldiers and and British soldiers, for that matter, were involved. Um, and al although um, I suppose in, on the scale of casualties in the, gr in the Great War generally, it, it wasn't a hugely um, catastrophic day for, for the men that, uh, on, in that landing. Um, of course, for some it was. Um, and, but ne and nevertheless, this has become the focus for Anzac Day um, yeah, for the commemorations ever since. So, um, uh, yeah, so enough, enough of the waffling, really. Um, this web webinar is going to be looking primarily at, at the First World War, um, a little bit of Boer War, not, not Second World War. Um, An Anzac Day has come to, um, come to include all uh, men who lost their lives uh, or, who or who served in, 
Australian and New Zealand forces, but I'm not going to be looking at Second World War records, although I will reference them later on. So um, let's, let's uh, move on. So ANZAC, um, what it stands for, Australian New Zealand Army Corps. So we're just talking about Army today. Um, I should say right from the beginning that I've used various photos and images in this presentation, and they're not my images, uh, and I apologise in advance for any copyright infringement. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have um, put on this one, as you can see, the, the, the source where the image comes from. But it's a nice image um, because it shows an Australian on the left um, and a New Zealander on the right uh, with their lemon squeezer hats. That's what they were known as, uh, colloquially known as. And you can see why it's called a lemon squeezer yeah, hat, can't you, Alex? Really like yeah, so they're very distinctive uh, hats. Um, and that's a great photo uh, from that particular uh, blog, which is uh, all about, uh, it says 100 NZ uh, World, War, World War I postcards. So there's the link if you want to go and look at that. Um, where to start? I'm, I'm going to talk about records that are on Find My Past, but I'm also going to talk about wider records. I mean, we don't have a monopoly by any means, I'm, I'm pleased to say, uh, on Anzac records. And there, there are plenty out there that are free of charge. Unlike uh, the British records, which were been systematically destroyed and weeded by the MOD and War Office over the years, and then um, the Germans tried to finish that off in 1940 by bombing <laughs> the warehouse. The Australians have not suffered uh, at, at such vandalism. Um, and so, so you can find records, uh, original records, original papers uh, in the archives in Australia and New Zealand, and I'll pick up on that later on. But I, I would say um, the best place to start, first of all, um, and to, to look, look around, is this uh, discovering... ANZAC's um, website, which has a, a huge amount of information on it, and it is, a, is a partnership between uh, with Archives New Zealand and National Archives of Australia and the Australian government and others. Uh, I'm going to just run through a few of the, few of the partners here because it's worth stating. Um, so National Archives of Australia, Archives New Zealand are the principal partners, I suppose. Um, and then there are various contributors as well, uh, State Library of Queensland, State Library of New South Wales, uh, the Public Record Office Victoria, Archives Act, Berrima and District Hi Historical and Family History Society, uh, Camden Remembers, etc. Um, and then you have... Uh, we have Imperial War Museum UK, of course, um, Link Tasmania, and the Office of Aboriginal Affairs for the Victorian Government. So um, just pulling down that menu, uh, so and I'm going to focus on when it appears, on the records. So I've just highlighted records there. So if you click on that records link, you'll then see the different records that are within this site. And I've just focused that big black arrow uh, points to applications to enlist in the Aus Australian Imperial Force. So you can click for more information on that series, which is where that arrow is pointing to. And if you actually wanted to look at the records, you click on the reference number at the front. It's there. Now, in this case, it says, uh, unfortunately, the records, uh, this record is not yet ready to be transcribed. Um, so, so it is a work in progress, although, as we'll also see, uh, the website is slightly out, uh, out of date in places. Um, that's, quite, that's quite interesting that they've actually said this is way... Does that, is, does that imply that they're planning to digitise everything that's there? Basically? Yeah, um, if, you, if you heard that, uh, Alex is asking whether the plan is to digitise everything. I would think in time it is, uh, and probably a good time to talk about World War II records, actually, Alex, because, um, yeah. because you can find some records on... Um, the Australian War Memorial site, which we'll come to again later on as well. Um, some records for the Second World War have been digitised already, although the bulk have not been digitised due to um, privacy, I, I, Is I would think. Is it the same as the laws in the UK? Uh, I, I would imagine uh, pretty much so, yeah. But, oh, okay. yeah. Um, whereas our, because our Second World War records are still not released either in the UK, they're still with the MOD, although you can apply uh, you can apply for records. Um, just go to go, go to Google and, and Google Veterans UK, and you'll get to the MOD site. So that's that's a bit off topic because that's that's the UK, but um, but that's the way to do it. Um, so if we carry on clicking, um, you can go to the gallery as well, and the gallery is good. And this leads me it's going to lead me into the Heesman brothers. So if you click on the gallery, um, 
you can see that it's uh, I can't really read the number from here, but it's six, 65,000 records, I think. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. 5730, I think. Yeah, so that's so these are records that people have uploaded, uh, images of soldiers that people have uploaded, and it isn't just soldiers in uh, when they were soldiers, it's soldiers later on as well. So the image on the far right is of this man, George, uh, George Roy Hannes, uh, and his bride, uh, taken in 1926. Um, it's a great resource. Um, and I've uploaded photos myself. So these are the these are the Heisman brothers. And I have talked about these men before uh, in a webinar I did a couple of years ago. Uh, these these three men lived in Chailey in Sussex. And long story short, I I got hold of a a VOD nurse's autograph album, um, and it contains autographs from, from people who were recuperating at hospitals in Chailey in Sussex and I researched those men and then looked at the wider community in, in that same uh, village and there are a lot of men you know I think probably 600 men in total uh, for that for that uh, what is actually a very tiny and quite well healed for the most part village now um, and, and researched these men and there were the, the Heesman brothers were from a farm in Chailey they were the sons of a farmer uh, Edric Owen Heesman, and they all emigrated to Australia, and and there's there the three of them are there, and a, a chap called Jim Type, who's related distantly to these men, uh, sent me the photos, and I published them on my on my Chaley website at the time, and have since published them on the blog, and they they serve a good purpose for me because they illustrate um, the records that you can find for them in this country, and also the records you can find for them after they emigrated to Australia. So I will be talking a bit more about them, but. Uh, but I, having discovered this, uh, discovering Anzac's website, Anzac's website, I posted the photos. Uh, I just clicked, first of all, on, went to the search box, typed in Heesman, um, see what was already there. There was nothing there for these men. Um, there were 78 results in total for the Heesmans. Um, but then I just uploaded the photos. So this is uh, Frederick. And you can see there it says, uploaded by old soldier Saab, which is me. And that's the password I used um, for that particular site. And that's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, and if you clicked on uh, view the profile for Frederick Heesman, it takes you to the record which uh, exists in the Australian archives. And these records, as I say, for, for a start, they're, they're fantastic because they survive. Um, you, and you're pretty much guaranteed to find a record for Australian servicemen. Um, but they're also in full colour and they're in good condition, whereas, of course, th those of us who have British Army ancestors have to make do with weeded files or badly damaged uh, records in black and white. Um, but anyway, such, such is life. So that's, that's the, the typical um, attestation paper, first page of the attestation paper for the Australian Imperial Force. It gives you the details at the top, Frederick Heesman, number 291, place of birth, Sussex, England and he enlisted in Perth, Western Australia. And it's page one of, again, I can't really see that now, but it's uh, 65, I think, isn't it, Alex? Yeah, that is. 65. So, you know, again, they're pretty, pretty detailed, um, voluminous records. So, so here are the brothers. Um, so Frederick, who we've just looked at, lost his life uh, in 1917. Uh, so it's nearly 100 years since he was killed. Uh, he wasn't the... Uh, oldest of the brothers, that was Albert, who's sitting next to him on, on this little sequence. Anyway, he's in the middle. And then at the end, there's Gilbert, who is the youngest. Um, pleased to say his two brothers both lived uh, reasonably long lives. But, but of course, unfortunately, Frederick didn't. Um, so this is Albert Heesman, who's wearing the uniform of an officer in the Australian Imperial Force. But he's also, uh, on his breast there, got the military medal ribbon. So he... That would show you, if you didn't know otherwise, that although he's an officer there, he must have been another rank before then, a non-commissioned officer or, or, a, or a private, because the military medal was awarded to non-officers. So he's obviously won the medal and then been promoted later on, been, been commissioned. And actually Gilbert, um, although I hadn't mentioned this in this earlier slide, which I'll just go back to, um, Oh, I have mentioned Gil Gilbert Heesman, MM, and Albert Heesman. I haven't put the MM there. But, they, but those two brothers both won the military medal. And this is from Albert's record. Again, lovely colour document, very clear um, and clearly written. You can see, I mean, these, these documents evolved over time. So, so when the man joined up, his details would have been put in. 
then he uh, you know, so so he attests his name goes in place of birth etc um, and then when he joins the regiment the number goes in and then uh, then throughout his career it's added to so it's a chronological sequence of events uh, as it is for the British records for that matter but the difference here is you can see all the different colours of inks and the crossings out and it's it just adds a lot more um, as you'll find in other of our records for that matter on, on Find My Pass where, where it's in colour great to see the, the colour documents because um, because in, in the later documents you see the additions uh, for instance 1939 register you see those entries crossed out and new names written in in different hands and different inks uh, so this is also from uh, Albert's record um, and this is interesting because it shows you here when he was awarded the military medal um, so it says awarded military medal uh, 25th of October 1916 so he was still a private soldier then and of course you know I'm not going to go through it all now but you could quite easily go through there and chart exactly what he did and it's very very detailed you know it says I can read even I can read from here um, 24th of May 15 to be corporal then he had influenza admitted to third Canadian stationary hospital and so on and so forth it is very very complete if you wanted to find out the citation for the military medal where would be or am I am I jumping ahead of you here? no you're not Alex that's a great qu great question um, citations for mili military medals um, <coughs> They don't generally survive, um, but keep an eye out for a book by Howard Williamson and Chris Bate, which is coming up uh, hopefully at the end of this year or maybe next year, which is uh, all about the MM, and they, they have done a lot of research. Um, in fact, I had a mail from Chris Bate this morning in, in answer to a query that I had on something else. Um, uh, so there, I consider them both uh, both pals, and, uh, and but both extremely knowledgeable about the MMs. They, they own the original MM cards, um, and uh, they've done a lot of research on this, and they... Uh, they, as a result of their research and the, the way in which military medals were awarded, um, they have been able to um, assign, if you, if you like, citations to a number of men where those citations no longer exist. So, um, so the thing is to do to, to wait. For, I mean, there are a number of books out on the on the MM, but they just pretty much list the the name of the man and the, the medal. Um, you know, when, um, when it was awarded, the, or not when it was awarded, even just just the um, man's number. Would uh, that be similar for newspapers, do you think? Not we talk like trove and obviously yeah. we've got some Australian newspapers. Yeah, you can find you can find uh, if you're lucky you'll find reports in newspapers and I'm okay. just researching somebody at the moment where the citation doesn't survive but but a local newspaper says it was for a trench raid on you know uh, nineteen seventeen. I've seen so a lot of UK newspaper reports where I'm hoping to find a citation that they just list the date, the rank and the name regiment they don't go into specifics. Yeah well some so, some do and some don't. So um so you'll find as I say this particular chap I'm researching it's it's very specific that he was awarded the MM for this particular action. So it depends on, and there's a photo of him as well. Wow. But it, uh, it depends really on what, um, uh, you know, how how much uh, space there was in the newspaper that day, I suppose, and how interested the sub-editor was. But um, but anyway, let's carry on going. So, uh, and the files contain recent correspondence. So this is from Albert, writing from Australia in 1968, saying, uh, I wish to make application for a Gallipoli medallion. Um, so he was still... You know, all these years later, I can't remember when he was born, was it 1893? Um, so, so he's in his 70s at this stage, writing uh, to ask for an, a Gallipoli medallion, and somebody's written eligible at the bottom there. Um, th there's his uh, address, Marine Rock, uh, Western Australia. That's probably a terrible pronunciation of it. So. Um, and, you know, here's, here's what you find on Find My Past for Albert Heesman. Again, it's a great, it's a great name. It's not a common name. Um, so if you click on... You know, my, my search criteria here was just Albert Heesman, so I went to find my past looking just in the Australia and New Zealand records collection. Um, I typed on uh, typed in Albert Heesman, and then I'm finding passenger lists. So that's him going to Australia. I'm finding embarkation lists when he's with the Australian Imperial Force. Uh, I'm also finding electoral rolls. Then the passenger list he returned to the UK in the 50s. I'm not sure what that was for. I could probably work it out. Maybe a death of a parent perhaps, or or some other unconnected family reason. But there's a lot of information there for him. Um, and talking of embarkation roles, again, you know, I'm not going to be precious about this. You can find these on uh, on other uh, on, on the Australian War Memorial site. So, and you can see the image there. So we've Find My Past has indexed the original roles, and we've indexed it fully, um, which opens up far more search possibilities. So you could search for um, the particular regiment and you could see a complete listing of the regiment when those men embarked or you could search by town to see when all these you know or place 
Um, so there's, there's a very full index that we've created. Um, but you can find the original roles on the Australian War Memorial site, and there is the link there again for that. Um, there's, this is our version of the, uh, the typical entry. So this is Albert Heisman again. Uh, you get his service number, his, his rank, because of course he enlisted or embarked as, as a private. He was later commissioned. Gives you his uh, marital status, single, labourer, Church of England, his age, etc., etc. There's a lot of information there, all fully indexed um, by Find My Path. And that's how, the, that's how the search page would look uh, for the Australian Imperial Force embarkation. And if you want to find that, oh, again, I'll come to this later on, the uh, best way to do it is to go to the A to Z records and just start typing Australian. So A to Z record search, that's your first point, and then start typing Australia into the search box at the top, and you'll see all the records um, that we have that begin with Australia, or that have Australia in the title. Um, so there you've got, what have I highlighted there, Embarkation Regiment Unit, uh, so you could search by, yep, by that unit. Um, and on that one, I'll just go back actually to that one, I, I put in the service number. This, this is just by way of emphasising again, and I always emphasise this, the beauty of the wildcard. So the wildcard is an asterisk, and you can use that with uh, uh, abandon, um, just, just throw it in wherever... Uh, wherever appropriate, you can use it with one character or, or more than one character. Um, but basically, it will pick up uh, any record with, in this case, the number one um, and digits following the number one. So, show you that. So that shows you there's 444 results for men uh, who served with the 19th. Is it? Alex, again, I can't see my eyes. It's so bad. 19th Infantry Battalion. Um, uh, and with the service number beginning one, it gives you 444 results. And if you put in the wild card before the one as well, you're looking for, so that's looking for men in this particular unit that had the number one somewhere in their regimental number. Uh, that increases the results to 1259. So, I mean, do, do use uh, the wild card. And, I mean, I, I use an example uh, for the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders where you're searching for a man for that particular regiment. If you were to type in, Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, full like that, you get nine results. Um, if you were just to type in um, wildcard ARG and then another wildcard, you get 39,000 results for that regiment. So uh, it's definitely, definitely a tip uh, that everybody should follow. We should print it loudly on the site so that everybody knows. Uh, so in this case, what did I do there? I was typing for uh, for men looking for, looking for men who have a surname with the initials uh, Sun S O N um, in, in the name, and it came up with 80 results. Again, looking for that particular battalion, and there there it is. I've just highlighted it. So that will pull up all men serving in that particular battalion who have the initials S O N in their surname, either at the beginning or at the end. Um, so it's just, just an example of, of how to use that wildcard. But anyway, while, while talking about the embarkation role, let, let's not forget the nominal role as well. So that's also, you'll also find that on the Australia War Memorial site, and you'll also find it on Find My Path. <laughs> <laughs> just checking that Alex is still awake, and he is. <laughs> um, so there, there you have it. So you can search on first name, last name, year of enlistment, service number, and rank. There you go on Albert Heisman. That's just coming back to the results we looked at earlier on for Albert Heisman. So I'm just going to use this as a way to show you what other records we have for him after the First World War, or after and before. So there, there you've got uh, his name appearing on the passenger list, which we saw a minute ago. So that's the passenger list in 1910 when he when he first emigrated to Australia. I can't remember now whether he was the first one to go out or whether uh, or whether one of the other brothers went first. I think he probably was the first. Um, so, but anyway, there he, there he appears as a farm worker. And then later on, as I said, in 1952, he's there again, uh, this time with his wife, coming, uh, going back to Australia again from Britain. Uh, so he'd obviously been over here for, for a reason. Um, and he's, his full address is listed there. He's, uh, he's a farmer by now. His wife is listed as a housewife. Um, and as I say, his, his address in Australia is given. And then the Australian electoral roll down there as well for 1939, 
tells you again um, very clearly that he's a farmer um, and that his wife uh, Minnie was engaged in home duties. So, so very useful. So, you know, with and you know, of course, going back to before he emigrated. Uh, so, if he emigrated in 1910. I think he was born in 1890, 1893, was it? Um, but you'll find him on censuses. Uh, you'll certainly find him on the 1901 census. He left too early for the 1911 census. But you'll you'll find uh, also birth records for him in in the UK. Then you get this uh, passenger list. You've got the AIF records. You've got the records uh, in Australia afterwards. It's all about, as we know here, it's jigsaws. It's putting the pieces together. Um, there will be a death uh, in Australia at some point as well that, that's recorded. So, uh, so his record and those of his brothers span both the UK and Australia, and you have them leaving the UK and arriving in Australia, which which is great. Um, let's go back to Frederick. So here's Frederick, uh, unfortunately, as I say, killed in action on the 26th of September, 17. And you can, again, uh, the beauty of these Australian records and New Zealand records, for that matter, is that you can find the war diaries. So there's a war diary for uh, the, the unit that he served with, which was the 13th Machine Gun Company. Um, and it's there. It's on the National Archives Australia website. Put the link at the bottom. This is for the Australia Imperial Force uh, Unit War Diaries. And it's just drop down, so you need to. Uh, there's a, select, a section for infantry or machine gun or engineers, and, and in this case, he's machine gun, so you click on the machine gun entry. And that's what then appears. You get the page for the different units. You find the unit that you want, which is the 13th in his case, Australian Machine Gun Company. And they're PDFs, um, so you can just click on the PDF, and there, there it has it. It's brilliant. Oh, wow, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's very, it's very easy. Um, and, and, yeah, beautifully, beautifully simple. Um, there's nothing really specific for, unfortunately, for this particular event when he was killed. It's just, it's Passchendaele. It's just the chaos and the mud and the confusion and the terror of Passchendaele, and. Um, but thankfully, there is yet another great resource which you can find, which is Search First World War Red Cross Wounded and Missing. So it says here, these files consist of approximately 32,000 individual case files of Australian personnel reported as wounded and missing during the First World War. And there is a report for, for Frederick. Um, it says, uh, the files were created by the Wounded and Missing Inquiry Bureau, Bureau of the Australian Red Cross. Um, the Bureau commenced operation in October 1915 and sought to identify, investigate and respond to inquiries made regarding the fate of Australian personnel. And I, I would presume this is what happened in Frederick's case, that somebody uh, inquired, you know, maybe his parents uh, inquired about him, what had happened to him. And although you don't see that original inquiry from them, there is a, there is a letter from somebody who saw what happened. And he writes, um, this, this is uh, W.S. Harrison of the, of the same company. He says, I saw Corporal Dyer, signaller, and Private Heesman killed by the same shell and helped to bury them where they fell at the old German front line, then our position just in front of uh, Zonnebeek. They were buried in the same grave, which was marked by a rifle. Dyer came from South Australia, and Heesman came from Western Australia. So, so there you have it. It's, um, it's a tragic, poignant report, but it's evidence um, from somebody who served with these men. Um, evidence that they that they were killed and how they were killed without going into a huge amount of detail but the bodies were obviously lost uh in subsequent fighting because i don't know about that i've not checked him but he'd be easy enough to check um but certainly frederick is isn't um doesn't have a known grave and is commemorated on on a memorial in france uh, in belgium rather but anyway i'm i, I won't uh, go any any more into the Heesmans, but you can read about them if you want to by going to my blog, uh, which is there. It's all about Chaley, and you just look at uh, Chaley's, there's a section called Chaley's Men, and you'll find that I've written about the Heesman brothers there. And if you can add anything about them, uh, please drop me a line. So, I mean, I've talked about the um, Australians to date. Let's, let's talk about some of uh, the New Zealanders as well. I mean, there's, it is the Anzacs. Um, the National Library of New Zealand is a, is a good place to look as well. There's some great photos on there. When I was looking the other day, I found some great photos of the, of the New Zealanders. 
And if you go back to this uh, Discovering Anzacs uh, website um, for the Army, there's a, there's a good section there which says New Zealand Defence Force, um, Army, Military Personnel Files, more information on that series, click on that. Um, there. And it says the series covers the original personnel files, military history sheets, and microfilm strip copies of original personnel files for the New Zealand Defence Force. And it goes from the 1800s um, and certainly covers the First World War. It says at the bottom, um, they hope to finish by uh, 2014. So that's how it's out of date, <laughs> Alex, because <laughs> we're, we're now 2017. And, they've, uh, and they, they put an estimate there on, on a number of uh, files, 141,000. But when you actually go into it, um, there's far more than that. Um, there's a... Okay, yeah. 145,917 files. So, um, and they, f they follow a, a very similar pattern to the ones we've seen for the Australians. So, so the same sort of uh, detailed information, colour copies, um, files that, uh, individual documents that, that British historians would be very familiar with for their own British Army ancestors. The difference being that these are all <laughs> lovely, fantastic condition, <laughs> colour, not been weeded by over-enthusiastic bureaucrats in Whitehall, not been uh, bombed by uh, the Germans, so they're, they're, they're great. Um, and again, you know, f full of detail. And again, you know, on Find My Past, if you want to look for records for New Zealand soldiers, uh, or New Zealanders generally, I would, uh, this is my advice, go to uh, search, uh, you can search for world records, go, go to the all record search or go to the A to Z record search and just type, start typing in New Zealand. So here there's a, a small database for New Zealand war war servicemen. Uh, and there's another one for New Zealand soldiers from the First World War. And there's a transcription there which just shows you, uh, as I say, there will be full records for this man on the, on the New Zealand, uh, you know, which you can get to via um, discovering Anzacs. But here is a summary of this particular man's uh, details. So you get his first name, his last name, address, uh, occupation. So it's a, it's a, it's a basic index. Um, prisoners of War. I talked about this at um, Who Do You Think You Are? Uh, last Was it last month or this month? This month, this wasn't month. it? Alex, gosh, yeah. gosh. Oh, it does. Um, it's worth pointing out here as well. And again, this isn't a Find My Past resource but it's worth pointing out to those of you who uh, have an ancestor who was a prisoner, prisoner of war. Um, again, apologies if this is teaching some of you to suck eggs, but go to, uh, go to Google, ICRC POW will get you to this site. The ICRC is International Committee for the Red Cross, um, and you can then start looking to see if your ancestor was a prisoner of war. So you would uh, type in... I had too far? Maybe I have. Yes, I have. So... Um, so you can specify the search criteria here, type in the name. I've just typed in Nixon here, and I'm just I'm looking at British records, but, um, but the main heading there is British Army and Commonwealth. Um, so that would include Australia, of course, um, and New Zealand. You then have to validate that. So having, having put the name in, you have to validate. You have to, have to hit that validate button there. There we go. It's a handy arrow. Um, and that's the results you get, different spellings of the name as well. I'm just going to look at this particular regiment in the Royal Scots. This man is no relation to me. It's a different spelling of my name anyway. Um, but here on this, this image is a summary card of this particular man. And you have these PA references, which are worth noting. This man's got several. There's four different PA references on his card. You then click on the additional information about this person box. And type in the PA reference uh, in the panel on the right-hand side. So just looking at the PA numbers on the image, replicate that, type it into the box. Some, some references will be R as well, for that matter. And there's a drop-down arrow there. You can see where it says PA printed. There's a drop-down arrow. It will drop down for an R as well, or for other prefixes. Type it in. There you go. There's those arrows. Type it there and there. And it will bring up the, the page. So that PA reference is a reference to the page. So in this case, it was PA8066. 
and this is the reference, uh, this is the page number, 8066. There you go. Uh, this tells you uh, that, that second arrow that just flew in, that tells you the camp he is at, prison camp, and there's the man's record. I'll just go give a little bit more detail on that. So there's an incredible amount of detail on, this, on these POW records. Um, it, it would really benefit from some great indexing, this site. I mean, it's a good resource, but the indexing is shocking. Um, and it can take you a while to find your man if you're lucky enough to find him ultimately. Um, so here you've got his date of birth and his place of birth. You've got his um, next of kin there. You've got the place of capture and the date of capture. So in this case, it was Cambrai on the 30th of August, 1914. Um, status, so it says kind of wunder, which means no, uh, not wounded. And uh, this is the camp he's come from, which is Dulman, POW camp. It even gives you the company he was serving with uh, for in that particular battalion, which was the 2nd Battalion of the uh, Royal Scots. Um, this isn't POW, this is just, I suppose, just a way of illustrating that there's still a lot out there. I bought this photo in February this year. I was in Cambridge visiting a friend and happened to see this in a local antique shop and uh, picked it up. It was £20. Um, it shows uh, what I've since discovered to be um, officers, newly commissioned officers, actually training um, in Devon, uh, they're, they're artillery officers. The interesting thing about this photo is there's a lot of New Zealanders in there and four military medal winners as well. So again, men who would have been, who've won the medal as a private or a sergeant or an NCO and then have gone on to be commissioned. And um, there's a lot of information there. Again, if you wanted to, to look at that, you can go to another of my blogs, um, British Army Medals, Blogspot, um, and you can read about them. It, there's, it's number two, Royal Field, Artil Field Artillery Officer Cadet School. Um, and as I say, there are four MMs on show. And now when I was putting this <coughs> presentation together, uh, I was intending to put some other slides in for this because I did find quite easily on, in on internet searching um, information about some of the men in here. One of these men was uh, played for England in, in rugby, oh, actually. Well. Yeah, yeah, he did. And, um, so was, it, was, there, was there quite a high proportion of, of Britain who, who were and, um, back forth, um, I, there would have been Alex, yeah, because there was quite there was a lot of uh, emigration to Australia and New Zealand in the uh, in the early 20th century, and so those men and and to Canada for that matter as well. Okay. So so Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, which is very off topic here for this particular webinar, but that was that was primarily men who had initially anyway uh, men who had served in the British Army and the time expires, and then they you know, this new battalion was was. Um, uh, was created, and, and these were these were ex-British Army regulars who who joined this new battalion oh, wow. in Canada. But yeah, the same the same would have been true for for men going across from this country to uh, Australia and New Zealand, and they are they're still they're, there's still that connection with with uh, the United Kingdom, and they're answering the the king and their king and country's call, and so they're then going back, um, you know, to to fight for Britain in her hour of need. Um, so, so yes, I mean, it's, and as I say, you know, we talk about Find My Past and other online resources for genealogy, and I've been talking about quite a few that are there for Australia and New Zealand specifically, but it's always worth um, doing a Google search, just a basic Google search on a name, uh, or put a known, known information in. So in this case, you know, there's one chap here called uh, Prime, his surname is Prime, I forget his Christian name now, but I, I found photos of him in an archive um, online, and was able to match the photos oh, that I found to the photo in here. Oh, okay. So, so there's some good stuff out there. Um, so, sort of coming to the end now. So, those, those of you uh, out there, I'm on slide 68 of 73. You, some of you will think, thank, thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think so. I don't but, uh, anyway, so, so just to round off um, uh, the basics, really. So, if you want to to look for the, find the records on on Find My Past, see what we have. Uh, I would always 
search A to Z of records. If you have an odd name like Albert Heisman, or another example I use, Vernon Swatman, then <laughs> that's a cracking name, isn't yeah, it? Um, um, he was responsible for the song One Vernon Swatman, There's Only One Vernon Swatman, actually, Alex. Really? <laughs> he what, was. What, what did he do to make him the only one Vernon Swatman? Well, I don't know. His parents obviously liked the name Vernon, and there weren't many Swatmans. Oh, I don't, but anyway, it's, it's a fantastic name. And, he, and again, he's, in all seriousness, he was a soldier who served in the First World War. Uh, and lost his leg. Um, and, and again, I've written a little bit about him on another of my blogs, which I, I can't remember which one it is now. Army Forms and Attestations, I think, uh, in that particular case. But um, yes, go to A to Z of Records sets and start typing in Australia or New Zealand. See what we have. Uh, so in this one, I've just typed, start, started typing AUS. And, and you'll see as you type that the records will appear. And you can then uh, you can you can browse by record sets as well. If you go to the Australia and New Zealand records, search all records. You can browse by record sets, select the ones you want. So here I've just clicked on a few there. And if you then apply the filters, hit that blue box at the bottom, you'll see the little lozenges that, that appear at the bottom there. Of that screen. Those are the records I selected. If you then search, I've not shown the search button on here, but if you then search, you'll get results. Uh, which are basically pulling up all the men, or, or, or the uh, individuals rather, that appear in those four record sets. And what you can do, and I've done this myself, is then go to the, the, the bar at the top um, and copy that URL, copy that address, and save it as a bookmark. And what you've basically done there is create your own landing page. So uh, I, I find that very useful. So for instance, if I wanted to create a, a landing page for India records, British India records, I could go to um, the search all records, first of all, then on the browse record sets, type India, and click for all those that have the British India office collection, and then run the search. And then I've, lo and behold, I've got my India office collection page. And I can save that. Um, bookmark it and then just keep going back each time and I've got my uh, India Office landing page. So um, so this is the last slide um, and I just finish on this because um, because it's appropriate um, because it is a day of commemoration um, and we should remember the sacrifices and this, this is a sacrifice uh, a document certificate that would have been issued to the next of kin of uh, New Zealand's soldier in this case which gives you a lot of information it's a very beautiful um, certificate as well in terms of the artwork. I would love to get hold of one of these myself to put on my wall at home. I have lots of certificates for other men and other you know, serving in other services, but I don't have one of these. But it's a beautiful thing, and I um, and you know, apart from anything else, it's a commemoration of this man's life as well. It gives you the details of when he joined up and served and when he was killed, and it's just a nice uh, a nice token, I think. Um, so that was issued to the next of kin of New Zealand servicemen. So on that note, um, I'm going to finish this webinar. Um, and thank you for listening, those of you who've listened. And by all means, ask questions. Uh, we, I'm sure my, uh, our willing band of helpers has been trying to answer questions as we've been going on. Um, and Alex, maybe is going to pull, pull a question or two up and see if we can answer them live. You're going to yeah. put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Here you are, Alex. Well, I must admit, you must have uh, answered, you must have covered pretty much anything because we haven't had we haven't had that many in this week. Uh, but I think that's just an indication of how informative it generally was. Um, so the first one we've got actually, I was going to ask. So would that that image there? This is this is my own question. Uh, that w w was was. was was schemes like this run in other countries, and was this issued actually by the government, or was it a charity or some kind of veterans organisation? That's, that's a good question. Um, th thank you. I would uh, not a charity. Uh, got, presumably, the uh, New Zealand Expeditionary Force. The, um, it's the New Zealand, yeah, New Zealand Expeditionary Forces Surf Certificate of Services um, that would have come from come from them. Um, other countries. I mean, of course, Brit Britain had the. Uh, memorial plaque, uh, also known as the Death's Penny, which was issued um, to the next of kin of servicemen. So they they got the the, the bronze plaque and um, a photocopied letter from the king, basically, um, oh. and and a and a little certificate just with the name the name and the regiment on. Um, the closest we have in terms of a certificate is, uh, which is what I was referring to that I have at home, are the ones that were issued to men who were discharged. As no longer physically fit, um, 
the, the, the term is disabled, men who were disabled in the Great War, or invalided in, in the case of officers. And there's different versions of, the, of those uh, which are around. But I've, uh, but I don't know. I'm sure there's something for, Aust for the Australians um, who were killed as well, for that matter. But I, but I just think this is particularly, um, particularly nice. It's uh, you know, the lion, the normal, normally uh, rampant lion, is there sitting cowed and oh, yeah. sorrowful mourning um uh, britannia is there as well sitting down you've got the fleet in the background um it's just beautifully done um from that talented generation yeah i love that i've never seen anything like that before yeah, i'd love to love oh, um so yeah first question um from chris uh white right uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Chris has said that she's found, um, she or he, I'm, I, I shouldn't assume, um, has found three IVIL soldiers on Far My Path, but for some reason can't seem to find any trace on them of them on Discovering Anzax or the N uh, New Zealand Archives website. Jenny, any, any idea why that might be? Uh, which were the soldiers? The IVIL, whatever that is. Um, no, I don't know. There should should be there. Um, follow. Just go through and look at those links. Discovering Anzacs or the. Uh, I don't know. Um, perhaps post the names up uh, here, and we'll we'll see what we can find as well. What to go, isn't it? Yeah. See see what we can find. Yeah. Might might uncover something. Uh, the other thing I should mention actually is, um, which I didn't mention so far, is the Great War Forum. Um, that's that's always a good bet uh, for for those queries that you can't find straight away. And I should also say, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, even when I was studying, uh, sh trying to research Chaley, uh, there was hardly anything online at all. Um, that was long before, uh, you know, Farmer far Past was, uh, was even a twinkling in anybody's eye. And so, so in those days, it was trips up to the National Archives. I mean, these days, there is so much out there, and you can often find things very, very quickly, uh, thanks to Find My Past um, and others. Um, but you know, uh, the tendency is there th is there to expect instant gratification, but it may not always come. And and so, you know, if you can't find something straight away, keep digging. Um, do go to the Great War Forum, which is all, which has been around for a long while, and there will be experts on there who can possibly point you in the right direction. So. Um, yeah, just Google that Great War Forum. It's something in Vision Zone is the is the web address, but uh, definitely worth getting involved in in that. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit selfish here and ask some of my own questions. Um, so one of the things I've been wondering is prior to uh, the formation of the Anzacs, because I'm um, am I right in thinking they were they were only kind of established just before the Gallip Gallipoli to kind of get yeah so before that how would how would Aust Australian or New Zealand fighting forces be structured and where oh, is this uh, is this a tricky one and where would you where would you look for them I think I've asked a hard one here <laughs> I, I think again um, Australian War Memorial is the best place uh, Alex or, or the or the, uh, the government's uh, website which I showed earlier on they, they've got they've got a lot of information there um uh, and they will also have the the Second World War stuff as well, so that's that's the place to go. That's really uh, okay. that that would really be my suggestion to go there first. Um, to you know, the First World War was the first time that um, there'd been a need for for men in in that part of the world to come to assistance, uh, and it was the, and, and hence you saw the birth of the you know, the Anzacs then uh, for the for the First World War. So there hadn't been. Um, so prior to that, would they, have, would they have been fighting in Australian or New Zealand regiments in the British Army? Uh, well, yes, they, they would have had their own um, setups in, in Australia and New yeah. Zealand. But um, yeah, the, the, the Australian War Memorial is a place to go to, to look for that. For any, anything Anzac, um, and as I say, discovering Anzacs as well. Just just have a look at, through that website and uh, immerse yourself in the detail that there, that's there, because there is a lot there. And um, another question from oh no we've got no we've got some more here. Um, well, uh, oh this is a good one. Um, another one from Chris. Uh, what was the oldest a man could be uh, to be to enlist to fight in World War One? Uh, probably more specifically the in within, within the Anzac forces. I believe uh, forty years old to start with. Um, yeah, because. 
So, I mean, the British Army originally um, didn't want men going overseas before the age of 20, but then, I mean, the, the rules changed during the course of the war. So you had to be um, 19 uh, to, to join, and then it went up as far as uh, the age of 40. So, um, yeah, so, so it covered quite a wide range. And late, later on, of course, when uh, the Derby scheme in, in Britain was introduced in conscription. Men were called up according to their age and marital status. So young single men would have gone first, and and later uh, up, up to up to the age of 40. Then married men aged 19, married men up to the age of uh, 40 as well. So um, so it's, so it was done in in uh, in age order and, and marital status okay. order. Um, so, ooh, this is actually more of a um, suggestion, I think, than a question. Yeah, this is. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for sending this in. Jennifer just, just said, uh, um, "Have you tried looking for citations on the uh, Austra Australian War Memorial website? Because she's found some success there in the past. So, if you are after medal citations, that's a great suggestion. Certainly, have a look." Um, and I'm going to ask another question as well, uh, simply because this is such a com common one I get at shows and stuff, and when we are speaking to researchers and family historians, people are always very keen to try and track down a photo, particularly when it comes to World War One era. Um, and I always find that a very quite hard question to ask, because if, you, if, you, if one isn't in your family's possession, where would you even begin? And what would be your chances of actually even tracking one down? Uh, yes, well, that's a good question, Alex. I, and I get asked that an awful lot, so much so that I wrote, um, I wrote a post about it uh, on, a, on a blog not so long ago. Um, I mean, the, the Discovering Anzacs website has come up with, the, with a, an answer, I suppose, to some degree, because you can search for a man and then you can upload the photos, which I did for the Heesman brothers. So if you have an Australian um, that you're looking for, that's the place to go there. For, for the British, there isn't, at the moment, a, a, a similar site. Um, but what I would suggest is, if you're looking for a photo, is the, to use the Great War Forum to, um, to think about creating your own a blog or website for that for the man you're looking for because uh, the, the idea being that the search engines will do the rest for you and I had some success with this uh, a little while ago which I have spoken about I think in another blog uh, another webinar uh, where I'd put one of my ancestors on there and somebody came back and said I've got the photo of this man and, and I I then bought the photo from him um, so, so I would definitely do that I mean in that particular case I had to wait nine years before that photo turned up but it was still Still worth waiting, yeah. But I wasn't looking. But the, but the thing was, I mean, it, I was in no particular hurry for it, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, just, it's you're purely at the whim of the search engine. But, but I, um, you know, the usual things. Uh, make sure the the content is relevant, um, and you know, if necessary, re refresh the content as well. Um, but you know, Google, I guess, found found that particular blog of mine, blog post of mine, when the chap who bought the photo on eBay uh, was then looking for information about him. He was a uh, Bedfordshire Regiment officer who'd won the MC. No, there was no name, um, but only when he Googled Bedfordshire officer MC, he came to my particular post and realised that the man's name was Eilif and that was my uh, my distant relative. So, so definitely do that and it can be done very cheaply. Um, also contact, uh, or think about contacting the Imperial War Museum because they have a photographic archive. Um, think about contacting regimental archives as well. Um, there's a number of things uh, that, you, that you can do, but I would say that creating a, a simple one-page website where you, you're asking for information about the man, give details about him, place of birth, give his um, brothers, siblings uh, details, his parents details. Uh, anybody looking uh, looking for that uh, man will uh, hopefully use an internet search engine and we'll We'll find him. Um, also, of course, post him on um, on, on trees. On uh, you know, put put, 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 put him on the farmer past tree as well. Um, so yeah, various things you can do. But uh, but I have to say, even so, with all that all that effort, the the chances of finding uh, something are probably uh, remote. But who knows? After nine years, one could turn up. <laughs> so I guess persistence is key. Yeah. Um, do you know what? I'm gonna actually try that because I've I'm desperate to track down photos of my great grandfather. Who's we've we've got no photos of him when he was in service, so we yeah definitely gonna give that a shot. Um, no, another question we had from Paula Ritchie. Thanks for sending it in. Uh, uh, 
there was there an Australian equivalent of the certificate we viewed before, but I think we, we, we very quickly covered that. We, 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 just, we don't know really, do we? There, there may well be, but um, it's probably worth contacting the Australian uh, War Museum or War Memorial or, or the Great War Forum, yeah, posting question on the Great War Forum. Someone may well, um, someone will probably answer and put you in the right direction. Um, yeah, because I'd, I'd love to own, some, I'd love to have something like that to put up on the wall. That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? And yeah, one last question for me, and then I'll let you go. I think Paul's going to need glasses after this because throughout the whole duration, I've, I, for some reason, his slides were minute. So put you really had to strain, didn't you, to get some of the details out? But uh, so you can rest your eyes after this and maybe bring a jeweler's eyeglass next time. Um, yeah, so finally, um, a question I've always wondered was. I guess every individual story is different, but is there kind of like a common common experience a lot of these men had when they got back from service? Is, 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 or, and is there anywhere that would be a good place to look for these guys once they're back in Australia and New Zealand? Or, or was it really varied? Everyone went off and did, did their own different things or they kind of on schemes or anything? Uh, yeah, thanks, Alex. I, I, I think, you know... Um probably similar to, to the UK. Men just got on with it. They just got, got back to the UK and got on with their lives uh, as much as they could. There was no um, post-traumatic stress disorder counselling um, as, as such then. Um, they just had to get straight back into work. Um, but, you know, in terms of records that survive for, for Australia, again, look at the uh, look at the records we have online. Um, Electoral rolls are a good, good way of tracing people. Also, um, you know, the same goes for this country as well. Um, and it sort of goes back to what I was saying originally about the lack of records online 20, 30 years ago. Use your local archives or the national archives, you know, because there is material out there which has not yet been digitised by us or others. Um, so, so do use your local archives. Um, use your local family history societies. Uh, speak to people there. Um, you know, everybody, it's a very, very common to say, OK, you know, I want to find out information about my grandfather uh, because, you know, he he never talked about the war and now he's died, it's too late. You know, that's, that's so common. We prob I probably hear that every day and Alex probably hears it as well. Um, and, you know, that's that's the nature of it, I'm afraid. That's the, uh, you know, men didn't feel they could necessarily share their experiences with those who hadn't been there and a lot of them clammed up and didn't talk about it or if they did, talked about it only very much in later life. My own grandfather didn't talk about it at all. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's it, the information that we have about his service has come uh, with difficulty later on through looking at various sources, um, piecing together these jigsaw puzzles. So, you know, there, I suppose there's there's veterans organisations, Alex, like, their, like the Royal British Legion here, um, there are other organisations, St Dunstan's in this country for blinded, what well, used to be called St Dunstan's, it's uh, called something else now, for blinded servicemen, charities may have some records. Um, uh, yeah, again, multi multiple sources really. Um, so I think there's, there's no simple answer probably. Um, you, we would cover, and uh, as does the Australian War Memorial and National Archives of Australia, the main sources, the primary sources, but there will always be outlying sources as well, which can be uh, unpicked if you can only get hold of them. Great. Well, I think that's it. So thank you very, very much, Paul. That was that was fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you all did too. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying exploring our um, Australian records for free if you're, if you're a complete newbie because they've been free over the weekend um, to allow you to uncover the sacrifices your ancestors made and honour their memory. Um, and yeah, um, if, you, if you've enjoyed exploring the records and you've still got more to discover, uh, don't forget to try our one month for a dollar offer, which I believe ends on Sunday. So make sure you don't miss that. So yeah, thanks again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and hopefully you'll join us for our next webinar, which I believe is next week. And I think that's a getting started beginner focused one. Um, I, I think that might even be my, my dulcet tones on that one. So uh, yeah, tune in next week for more. Um, Bye. Bye-bye.